All right. Well, welcome everyone to our first of hopefully many conversations about the rights of nature. Uh, my name is Chandler with Save Our Great Salt Lake. Um, I say conversation on purpose. This is going to be pretty casual tonight. We're not going to do any slides. Uh, we just found uh, at Save Our Great Salt Lake that as we started to educate ourselves and talk to folks in the rights of nature movement, there was so much to learn and uh, we really want to open up these conversations to all of you. So um, throughout tonight's event, feel free to drop questions, comments, feedback into the chat. We will have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, although we may try and get to some questions throughout if we are able to do so. Um, so I'm just going to give like a one minute background on Save Our Great Salt Lake and kind of how we got here and then we will get into our uh, discussion tonight. So um, like I said, my name is Chandler Rosenberg. I'm an organizer with Save Our Great Salt Lake. We got started in uh, September of 2021, just about here after hearing about the state and fate of the lake and wanting to do all we could to raise awareness and find opportunities uh, for folks to get engaged and make it easy as possible for uh, people to understand what's happening in the policy arena, kind of with the science. Um, so our focus is really this awareness building. We do a lot of social media and events. Uh, we did a Great Salt Lake Lobby Day this year. We had a people summit. So just trying to provide this on-ramp for community engagement. Um, following the 2022 legislative session, so last spring, uh, we felt like we had just worked so hard for, you know, these piecemeal incremental policy decisions that still uh, have yet to take any real effect. Um, and so we started to think about, you know, what would it look like if we were going to fight for what we really wanted? And uh, we started to explore the rights of nature movement and connect to different groups and found our way to Grant and Talking Rivers, who uh, Grant with the Earth Law Center and Blake and Sinsoon with Talking Rivers, who are with us here tonight, um, and just started to have conversations about what their work looked like, what rights of nature is. Um, and we had an event last October. We brought them both out. I want, I don't know if any of you joining us tonight were there with us, but uh, we had a great time. Um, just really kind of opened up this conversation for rights of nature and started to invite community input on a um, preamble for what is now a draft resolution for the rights of Great Salt Lake that we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so uh, with Save Our Great Salt Lake, I like to kind of talk about or think about the solutions for Great Salt Lake in two categories. We have these short-term solutions that we need to get water to the lake, you know, urgently to prevent the worst of the ecosystem collapse. But then we also need to think about the long-term kind of cultural systemic solutions that are gonna get at the root of how we got here in the first place, kind of the culture that has allowed us to treat water and nature as disposable, as something that's just here for our use or can be used for profit. So um, really excited to talk about all of this with you all tonight. Sorry, just, oh, thank you, Nan. I think you're helping me let folks in. Um, and yeah, with that, let's get into it. So I'm here with, uh, Grant Wilson of the Earth Law Center and Blake and Sinsoon with Talking Rivers. They are artists and activists and just all around inspiring people. Um, so I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Grant, why don't we start with you? I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, how you came to this work and um, who the Earth Law Center is, what the work looks like at Earth Law. Sure. Thank you so much for having me here today. Great to have everyone here with us. Uh, my name is Grant Wilson. I'm the executive director of Earth Law Center. We're a uh, nonprofit uh, legal organization that advances earth-centered movements, um, especially legal ones, but also education and social movements. We work in the U.S. and all over the world. Um, we have a team of about 10 who gets to do this exciting work for their careers. And um, I came into this field work, uh, working on wolf conservation and um, in Washington state, was really excited when wolves came back for the first time in 80 years after they'd all been hunted to death and then was horrified when um, soon I read about a wolf who had been poached in the newspaper and someone showed up to a post office with a bloody box and wondered, why is there an us versus them mentality, humans against nature? Um, how did this come to be in our culture? And you know, soon learned a lot of it had to do with our legal system, which divides humans and nature, separates us and treats us as you know two different spheres of the law. 
Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in the context of the rights of nature movement after my introduction. Um, but um, I'll just close with a couple little things. One is that if you're um, in education in any way or interested in this movement, we do have a course book that was written for law students, but can be read by anyone that's all about Earth-centered legal movements, such as the rights of nature, which again, I'll talk about a little more in a minute. That's called Earth Law, Emerging Ecocentric Law. I encourage you to uh, check that out. And um, you know, additionally, if you're ever in uh, Durango, Colorado, that's where I am just down the road in the traditional territory of, of the Ute, um, stop by. We have a little office downtown. So that's that's enough for me. I'll pass it back. Awesome. Thank you, Grant. Um, Blake and Sinsun, we'd love to hear from you just a little bit about who you are, how you came to this work, and how Talking Rivers was born and what it is that you guys do. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us to be part of this beautiful conversation. Thank you for, to everyone who's joined this conversation. And to start off, I'd love to first to say that we are all on traditional Haudenosaunee territory, specifically the territory of the Ganegahaga Mohawk Nation. Myself, my name is Sinsun Aguilar-Itso. I use they, them pronouns. My name is Blake Clavia and I use all pronouns. And we are part of Talking Rivers. So how did Talking Rivers come to be? We started organizing and bringing to the communities in this area to talk about the environmental future of this bioregion. And we decided that the current solutions, just as Chandler has mentioned, or the current options that we had on the table just weren't enough. We needed a paradigm shift. We needed to really begin to look beyond ourselves, beyond the barriers of what is human and acknowledge all the other myriad of living beings and natural entities that make up our world. And so to honor our own responsibility, we formed an organization called Talking Rivers, specifically advocating for the rights. And that is the two forms of rights, either R-I-G-H-T or R-I-T-E-S. So either the legal rights, but also the roles and responsibilities we all share towards each other, specifically the rivers that bring life to all. Thank you guys. Um, Grant, to ground us in a little bit of context, can you tell us about the history of the rights of nature movement, kind of how it came up in environmental law, and I guess where, we're, where we are now, some of the successes and maybe not so successes? or challenges, I guess, that the movement faces. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, and feel free to put any questions in the chat as I'm going, I'll kind of keep an eye on it. Thanks for putting the book title in there. Um, so yeah, you know, it's important to take a step back um, and just look at the you know overall legal system that we operate within. Um, there's something called um, jurisprudence, and this means philosophy of law. And, you know, a question to ask is, what is the philosophy? What are the ethics behind our legal system? And, you know, pretty much throughout our legal system, um, the philosophy and the ethics is one of human separation from nature. It's one of human ownership of nature, human superiority to nature. Um, and, you know, it turns out none of these things are true. Humans are not separate from nature. We're part of nature. Um, humans are not superior to nature. You know, we are at the will of nature. And, um, you know, humans do not own nature. We, we, um, our existence is, is part of this larger web of life and, you know, our, our own lives depend on healthy ecosystems. So, you know, all these philosophies that humans, you know, can dominate nature and are separate from it turn out to not be true, but yet they are the very basis of our entire legal system. And, you know, if you, if you can look to um, property law as kind of the basic, um, the basic way to think about this, humans own property. We can do with it whatever we want. We can buy and sell property to the highest bidder, whether it's, you know, a river or forest or water, you know, the essence of all life. And, um, you know, this culture of human dominion over nature um, obviously has played out with uh, the Great Salt Lake and many other ecosystems where we've degraded them up until the point of near collapse and there, you know there's no eco major ecosystem out there near to collapse in uh, the great salt lake um so you know this eurocentric ownership property based legal system um was has been the status quo since um um colonial legal systems came into being and um you know starting in uh, the 1970s um some you know traditional 
Western scholars uh, began to understand what you know many people have known, and especially indigenous people since time immemorial, which is that we need to figure out how to give nature a voice in our legal system. Otherwise, its its declines are going to continue. We need to give nature a stake in the law. And one way that can play out is by saying nature has rights. Nature has standing to be in court. Uh, nature has it exists, just like humans have rights, just like corporations, for better or worse, have rights. And um, this was written about by some you know, nerdy legal scholars in the 1970s. It, it was talked about in some court cases. Um, and then really in the last um, you know, 15 years or so, um, I think as a reaction to the greater mainstream understanding that you know biodiversity and uh, loss and climate change are an emergency for us all and this has been the case for a long time but it's a mainstream recognition now um there's been governments all over the world saying that you know what this this property-based eurocentric legal system that separates humans and nature was all wrong we think if if we're in a rights-based system nature needs to have rights alongside humans and what does this mean? It means uh, you cannot do whatever you'd like to nature and, and destroy it at your will. It means that if there's an ecosystem and you're going to harm the um, function, the basic functions of that ecosystem, you might have to think twice and replan whatever activities you're going to do to uphold the health of that ecosystem instead. It means that nature has a voice. And um, you know that doesn't always just mean in court. Um, it might mean nature has a voice in planning decisions. Nature has a voice in... Um, who can purchase water rights? Uh, nature has a voice in all elements of society. And there's all sorts of ways that can play out. There's uh, legal guardianship bodies where a body is set up to speak on behalf of nature. And those are in effect in places like um, New Zealand and Colombia. Um, you can also create mechanisms whereby you know, human um, public interest groups, you know, people like us can um, enforce and implement the rights of nature. And uh, this is starting to play out all over the world. There's rights of nature laws in um, almost 40 countries around the world, um, not, not national. Um, there's about four that are national laws saying nature has rights. Most recently, Panama last year passed a law saying nature has rights nationally. Uh, we're helping them implement that. But then also, you know, local communities and governments all over the world are saying, look, we need to give nature a voice. Nature needs to be part of our government, part of our decision making. And, um, and this has come to the United States as well. Uh, there's movements for the rights of rivers. Some are from municipalities, some are from uh, indigenous peoples, um, some are at the state level. And uh, there's a growing movement uh, at state level as well. Sometimes it's for uh, a river, sometimes it's for orcas. We're working on rights of orca populations in Washington state um, and ho hopeful for a state law there at some point. And there's all sorts of different ways it can play out. Uh, just one thing I want, I'll stop talking, this is my last point. One thing I wanna say, um, and uh, I'm sure our friends at Talking Rivers can elaborate more on some of the you know, nuances of campaigns. But one thing I want to say is that if we're moving away from this notion of property ownership, humans own nature, like people start getting worried. And I understand this about uh, property rights and ownership. And, you know, you might live on a piece of property and maybe you own it or your landlord owns it, whatever is the case. Um, and, you know, people are like, wait a minute, if nature has rights, if this land that I live on has rights, what's that going to mean for me? And I just want to clear up the air that, you know, there's these different bundles of sticks, they call them in the legal field of, of what it means to have a relationship with property. And, you know, a lot of those might remain the same under a rights of nature system. You can exclude, you know, nosy Joe, your neighbor from your property, if he's trying to come over and, you know, barge into your house, um, borrow some, you know, cooking utensils or something. Um, I would like to maintain that privilege myself. Um, you can enjoy, you know, your home uh, in peace and, you know, all these things remain. But what changes, the big thing that changes is humans, instead of having this uh, understanding that they can take whatever they like from nature, have a duty of stewardship, um, have a duty of regeneration of the land. And so instead of property owners that so we can do with nature, whatever we please, I think we can become, you know, stewards and, um, and guardians of nature. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that's that big a change when, um, the alternative is, you know, ecosystem collapse, which is what we're seeing. So that's some high level stuff. I know we're going to get into what all this could mean for the Great Salt Lake, uh, but I'll pass it back to you, Chandler, and, I, and then over to uh, Talking Rivers to get into a little more nuance and understanding of campaigns and what this might mean in the U.S. and with Indigenous peoples as well. Thank you, Grant. That background is so helpful. Um, 
I love also that you mentioned this idea of stewardship. That's something that we've tried to talk about. I think Ben Abbott at BYU and his report about Great Salt Lake uses the word stewardship because I really think that's an idea that we can tap into here in Utah. We have this, you know, cult dominant culture of spirituality and that we're here to steward the earth. And so how can we like weave that with this rights of nature movement? Um, something too, I find so striking. I think it's on your website. I've also heard from uh, Thomas Lindsay, who's a leader in the rights of nature movement, something like since environmental laws started to be enacted um, almost by almost every measure, the environment has gotten worse and so <laughs> environmental law is just not working. So we really do need this paradigm shift. Um, let's turn it over to you, Blake and Sin Soon. I uh, would love to hear about uh, the scope of your work and maybe what you guys are focused on now. You guys are really on the front lines of this kind of grassroots campaign, uh, rights of nature legislation work. So we'd love to hear what you are up to. Oh, but thank you, Chandler. Yes. So we have been working um, on uh, rights of nature here in New York State or the Noshone Territory for about now one year. Time flies. Um, and um, we all started, we, we got to know Grant's work and other people work. And um, as in some said before, we really wanted to see this for our area. So that just to give a little bit of understanding of where we are, we are in the northern farthest reach of New York State of the Noshone Territory. And uh, we are one hour from the Great Lakes, meaning Lake Ontario. And uh, we are like 15 minutes from the St. Lawrence River, the Ganyatalo Wananen. So um, we have three major rivers, the Grass, the Racket, and um, uh, the Oswegache uh, River that uh, flow very close to our homes. We, there's plenty of water here, from the Adirondacks to where we are, to the Great Rivers, to the Great Lakes. It's it's a ginormous amount of water, and it's everything but clean, everything but safe. So, in the in the context of this reality in which we have a lot of water, and places like Utah and other areas of the West, the water is going away. the the, pro, the water is a problem. There's no more water. So it's like. Um, like, what does that mean? Like, we don't have water on the other side. There is a lot of not healthy water here. What does it mean for the future of this planet? I mean, the Great Lakes are the largest freshwater basin in the world. We have a lot of responsibility. So this is why we have started talking about rights of nature. We don't have an impending doom situation like with the Great Salt Lake that is going dry, it's disappearing. And what does it mean for 10 million birds, for all the people that live there, for all the other species, for the, for the shrimp? Uh, we, we don't have that. We have an ecosystem that are suffering, but we don't have the doom yet. So this is why we wanted to start talking about the solution early. If we apply rights of nature early, like, can, we, can, we can protect these waters for the future generation and for the whole planet. So what we have been doing, uh, uh, just to give, for those of you that don't know, New York State, it's a um, um, home rule state. So um, it gives us more wiggle room when it comes to rights of nature, like some states will, will not allow any of it to happen up front, but like, uh, if we pass a resolution or if we pass a law uh, in a little town or village, that law stands at the same level as uh, the New York State Constitution. So if they even wanted to prevent, preempt it, they will have to move the entire, like all the governments, like the, the, the two houses, everybody will have to move and say, no, you little town up north cannot do that. So we are lacking. We can pressure our towns, also, um, like uh, New York State actually encourages um, towns through the, through the Green Amendment to like actually pass more stringent like environmental roads. So that's what we've been doing. We've been working with the um, Sutter town of Potsdam, New York, and also Canton, New York, and we have managed to get the, uh, the town of Potsdam, New York, this past November, to pass uh, a, um, a resolution for to grant the Racket River, the Anahuate River, rights. So um, we hope that the town of Potsdam uh, will now start working on crafting actual law 
uh, they are thinking about it, they, they are working on it. The town of Canton is a little bit more, the town and village are a little bit more in Canton, a little bit more like putting up fast about it, but a lot of people are mobilitating. And uh, this is like uh, the other part of what we are doing. We are trying to push the local towns to do things, but mostly we are educating. Um, we want people to actually uh, embrace the idea or, or like uh, own the idea of direct, direct democracy and actually come forward and ask the local governments to act on behalf of the river. And we, we just today heard, heard that we presented at a university class and we, some students just got inspired and have been sending letters to the town of Canton, like do something, we want this, to see this, this was, was very heartening for us. And uh, um, we are trying to educate people like through events such as this amazing event that uh, Chandler and the, uh, Great Sol uh, the Save the Great Salt Lake group has put together, but uh, also we are using art, art and storytelling. And uh, we are organizing it uh, for this next fall and uh, listening to water art exhibits still to bring people together around the concept of rights of nature and um, getting everybody involved with our possible levels. Thank you guys, such incredible work. I love that you bring up this idea of people getting engaged in democracy and kind of local democracy. Cause I think, you know, no matter how close or far away actual legislation that gives rights to the river or the lake or whatever it is may be, there's this idea, I think, underlying rights of nature that it's like, okay, we are all part of this ecosystem. So what does that mean? What is that, what kind of responsibility does that put on us? And then how do we act from that place? So I love that idea. Um, how, I'm curious to hear about the reception. How has the reception been from these towns? Like what sort of things do they say? What's the pushback? Um, or maybe on the other side, if they are kind of open to this idea, um, what does that look like? So one of the main things that comes up is that, oh, we don't need to do anything. The state and federal governments are doing such an amazing job already. So the first step is educating <laughs> and saying, no, number one, they're not doing an amazing job. Um, number two, they would actually step over your own authority and allow more entities to pollute. And, and finally, number three, what they do is completely out of your control. It's not happening at a democratic level. So we have this gigantic, huge bureaucracy that manages the environment. It happens at the state and it happens at the federal level. And this management we have seen has led to the destruction of so many ecosystems and to almost climate ecosystem collapse. So in order to move away from that, like you mentioned Chandler, we really are trying to put people to say no, as a democracy, we can act, even if it's a small, at a small level. And all of you, if it's a town or village board member or the village trustees, have a responsibility. You have a responsibility and you are part of these ecosystems too, and you can act and you have power. Um, so that's kind of the, where the conversation goes. I love it. Yeah, we've run into that quite a bit here in Utah, just talking to different agencies. I mean, be they state agencies, they kind of just feel like, you know, oh, it's not my job. This is too big. It's the state legislature. Um, so it's like, how do we change that thinking and get them to like, no, rethink how you do your job. <laughs> um, okay, back to you, Grant. I would love to hear what you've been working on lately. What does your day-to-day -day look lo like? Uh, what kind of rights of nature work are you up to? Yeah, just a you know a couple of things to highlight. You know, one, first of all, there's so much cool rights and nature stuff going on all over the world, um, and I'm honored to play a small part in it. Um, you know, I mentioned rights of orca populations. There's uh, southern resident orcas who are near an extinction in Washington State, and um, seven uh, local governments, city and county, representing 10% of Washington State's population, have passed proclamations on the rights of Southern resident orcas, um, which is pretty cool, pretty good chunk of Washington. And so now we're, you know, eyeing possible state level uh, support. And so I do think there's, um, you know, a possibility of local governments beginning the movement and then you get state and then, you know, eventually federal level support. 
Uh, there's there's uh, a cool uh, bill in uh, North Carolina as well. It's a, a state rights of rivers bill that uh, we're not working on, um, but um, there's some great indigenous led groups who are, who are doing so uh, on the Ha River. And uh, another thing to kind of pay attention to in the United States, um, internationally governments are you know so far ahead on this stuff and we're just kind of looking with awe. Um, you know, Aruba, um, a small island nation recently announced it is putting rights of nature in its constitution or it int intends to, and that'll be the second constitutional rights of nature provision after Ecuador. And it may also recognize the specific rights of marine ecosystems. So, you know, a, another water um, in that uh, initiative. Um, and then, you know, in Latin America, I, I highlighted, I think, um, you know, Ecuador and Panama is two places that are far in the rights of nature, but this is a movement that's just bread and butter law at this point. Um, you know, lawyers are learning about it regularly in law schools. Um, you know, in Colombia, there's dozens of court cases um, adopting rights of nature principles, even though it's not even in their national law or constitution. Um, or sorry, I think I said Colombia, but that's what I meant if I didn't say that. In Ecuador, there's all sorts of implementation happening, um, such as, um, implementing the rights of rivers for the Dulce Pamba River in Ecuador and ensuring that it has adequate natural stream flow patterns to um, protect its health, as well as the well-being of local communities who are being harmed uh, due to river floods because they messed with the um, physiological properties of the river. Um, so that's happening in, uh, in Ecuador. Um, but, you know, the list goes on in, in Latin America, you know, campaigns in, in Peru and, and Chile and their constitutional drafting is kicking off again for the second time. There's a movement towards the rights of nature um, in Mexico, you know, four states now have recognized the rights of nature and, and more coming. Um, so it's kind of happening all over the place. And, um, you know, I think the U.S. has had um, a lot of um, a lot of traction, a lot of attention um, here. And, um, you know, I think in the next couple of years, I'm hopeful we'll have a couple examples of, you know, the rights of nature really working well in practice, which is always the challenge here. Um, you know, when local governments do rights of nature stuff in the United States, that's uh, often in part because, um, one, it's, a, you know, a grassroots movement, so it happens locally. Um, but also, you know, there's state and federal governments that haven't exactly been supportive, so local is kind of what you're left with. Um, but just to reflect, you know, because I've talked about all these international case studies, I do think the United States um, is a place where the movement will really have practical implementation in the next few years, I'm hopeful. And, um, you know, part of that is having strong local grassroots campaigns, you know, local governments that are behind the movement and willing to engage in some creative exercises to show that it works in practice. And, um, you know, and people are really caring about an ecosystem in need. And that's all stuff that I think is, is in the recipe for, for the Great Salt Lake. Thank you, Grant. Um, this question is, I guess, for both of you, but uh, why do you think the US is so far behind these other countries on rights of nature? Is it just kind of the way our cultures are? And then I guess a two part question within the United States, um, what successes have you seen working through tribal treaties versus municipal governments? And kind of what are some of the differences there? Like is one pathway seem to be uh, more fruitful or are they just kind of depending on the situation? Um, what does that look like? Oh, sorry, is this back, for, back to me? Yeah, let's start with you. I missed that part. Sorry. <laughs> uh, when we were ping pong and I was like, yep, yeah, okay, on to the next. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, the US is mostly behind because, you know, they've actually had so much rights of nature activity here. There, There's so many great campaigns and, you know, Talking Rivers, um, their campaigns are just excellent. Um, I think just that, you know, the state and federal legal systems being hostile to the idea and the lack of very high level support is what has slowed down the United States. Um, you know, there was some talk in the, uh, Democratic National Party's uh, platform uh, when Biden ran about, you know, at least forming a commission to explore the rights of nature that didn't get picked up ultimately. Um, but yeah, you know, we the local jurisdictions are trumped by higher levels of law, and there is some room to kind of wiggle, you know, between the lines to you know make rights of nature happen locally. And 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 you know, I think I'm going to talk about how that can work for the Great Salt Lake in, a, in an exciting way. Um, but ultimately, you know, we need to get higher levels of government to support this. Uh, that being said, I think the more local governments that support the rights of nature movement, the more attention we'll get from higher levels of government, and you know, that'll speed up uh, the effectiveness ultimately in the United States. 
Um, but, you know, ultim ultimately, the other thing is that we have to overcome these huge problems like, you know, the property ownership model and colonial legal frameworks and, you know, everything's interconnected to these larger issues. Um, so we're kind of chipping away at it. Okay, so I'll jump in just to say that completely agree with everything that Grant said and jumping off on where Grant left off. Yes, one of them, we have um, the settler colonial legal model that prioritizes private property, <laughs> which of course began on the European continent, but really found its awful, awful heyday on this continent here. Um, and we see the destruction and, and conquest genocide of Turtle Island, what this what tribes here in this part of the other continent called Turtle Island, the continent. We see, we see, we see this violence that um, was unleashed by these conceptions of private property um, and of nature being a commodity that can be exploited, bought and sold. Um, so that has been really embedded in this government. Um, and also, if you look at really the foundation of the, the democracy that we call the United States, um, that democracy, if you look at actually how it was structured, a lot of these structures were really just to keep the elite, um, that were not the European elite, but the people who were migrated from Europe, that elite, how to, to, to keep them in power and keep everybody else in check. So we have to navigate through that power to kind of bring up rights of nature from the bottom up. The top is really set, it's really set up to be top down. So really to push against that is a, a very heavy lift. Um, and we're struggling in every way that we can. There have been lots of different cases of, across the continent in which we've seen rights of nature kind of break the norm. Um, some of them have met with failures, such as in Orange County, Florida, where they by 89% of the, the electorate passed by ballot measure a rights of nature law. But then, of course, the state jumped in and preempted it instantly. <laughs> um, we saw similar things happen with the Lake Erie Bill of Rights in Toledo. Um, and we, that those are cases that are frightening lots of local governments, have gotten a lot of very negative press. Um, but we need to remember that in any big movement, in any gigantic shift, paradigm shift, it takes time. Um, and sometimes hang time takes things grow slowly. Want to point out a case, one case, which is um, the Sac Suatl tribe suing the city of Seattle for not allowing fish passage in, in their dams. Um, just recently, um, so last week, um, the, um, the city of Seattle is now settling with the Sac Suatl tribe for, and saying that they have to allow fish passage in three of their dams. Um, the Sac Suatl tribe wants more, but the key about this is that the Sox was suing for the rights of tribal members, but also for the rights of salmon. There was no law in the books. They were just using customary law that had practiced since time immemorial. And that, after lots of pressure from lots of folks that said, Seattle, you will do it, you, you're, you're greenwashing right? like that. This is awful. They, the state of Seattle is settling. Um, hopefully they do more, but that's just an example of things converging. If there's enough public pressure, change can happen. Thank you. That is such an exciting case to hear about. Um, and I appreciate you bringing up the ballot and the, kind of the failed ballot initiatives. That's been some of the concerns I've heard from folks here when we've talked to different groups that say, okay, you want to do rights of nature, you have to do a ballot, a ballot initiative at the local level. And um, I think folks in Utah are used to pursuing ballot initiatives that get squashed by the state legislature. So there's been some hesitance to kind of pursue that route. But like you said, we have to understand these are such huge, huge structures that we are working to dismantle. So um, any movement in that direction is important. Um, so last question, and then we'll get into our uh, resolution, but Blake and Sinsoon, I would love for you guys to explain to us, you mentioned a little bit at the beginning and we've kind of touched on it, but this idea of rights, R-I-T-E-S versus rights under Western law. Can you explain what you mean by that? So as we have been talking, like as we've been saying until now, rights are like the civil rights are what the Western colonial system kind of grants people. Of course, we have rights and they're constantly violated, but on the larger scale, we can say that we have these rights and um, we are protected 
by the law under this right. And when we say we want to grant rights to an, eco an ecosystem or a specific non-human species, we want to give the rights that we have to the species that and the ecosystem that don't have them to bring them at the same level. So that when, when, we, when a human being goes to court on their behalf, they act as guardians to protect those rights. Um, but this is not how nature works. This is not how this planet works. So we, the, the rights of nature, the ecocentric paradigm shift we're talking about is recognizing that we are not the only society on this planet, that all the other living beings have their own societies, have their own way of existing, have their own sentience. We are not the only thinking beings on this planet. And um, rights of nature helps us do that because it, not, it does not, like when you grant rights to something, that something becomes a someone. And we have seen this over the ages now, like, before women were property and now they're not property anymore. They're someone. The same went uh, for slavery in this country. People were things, now they are people as they should be. And the same, we can uh, understand it for nature, like a river is not the thing. It's a someone, a very big someone with a lot of roles and responsibilities. And it's, and it's like, what are the river's roles and responsibilities? Like it, it's a river, but it keeps us all alive. If the river didn't do what the river does, we wouldn't be here. And uh, the same will go for all the fish that some of us fish and uh, the birds feed from and all the other beings, some of them so small, we can't even conceive of them. So when we talk about the rights, we talk about the cycles of life, the, so, the, the societies and the rights that these different societies and non-human societies have. And that we are roles and responsibility as human in this capitalistic colonialist society, we need to respect and honor. And, and we think that rights of nature, it's a step towards that because we go from something that we all know and we all kind of understand, which are, which are civil rights, to understanding that we are not the only society in this world. Thank you, such a beautiful explanation. Um... All right, let me make sure you can share your screen, Grant, and then Grant is going to walk us through um, the draft of our kind of rights for Great Salt Lake. So we, like I mentioned, our event in October, we had this big, um, I can't think of the peep scroll on the wall, and we invited attendees, members of the community to share what they love about Great Salt Lake, why Great Salt Lake deserves rights, and we've incorporated some of that into the preamble. So um, Grant, why don't you walk us through this, kind of the main components and maybe the process of putting this together. Hi, does that work? Do you see a document up there? Yep, looks great. First, a quick shout out <coughs> to Save Our Great Salt Lake, all the participants of this wonderful workshop who came out and uh, wrote language on a big piece of paper that inspired a lot of the preamble. Uh, shout out to Talking Rivers, uh, who've become you know, great, um, great uh, thinkers of how these resolutions can work. Um, shout out to um, Save the Colorado, and then uh, Marsha Moutrier, who's with Earth Law Center, who's um, helped write Santa Monica's um, sustainability rights ordinance and helps me with a lot of legal drafting stuff. And she pulled a lot of this together. Um, so uh, yeah, we have a resolution here and um, it starts with the preamble. The preamble is the intent of a resolution. So why are you doing it? And that's actually can be important when the, um, the substantive part, which is down here, is unclear at all. Um, you can go back to the uh, preamble and see why the heck did you do this in the first place? So uh, it, it serves that purpose. Um, and then it also serves the purpose of sort of being uh, a love letter to the Great Salt Lake, also a history of how the heck it got here to this point. Um, and you know, really tells a story of um, where we came from and how we got to this place where we really need to recognize its rights. Um, to save it. 
So um, I don't have to go through all the preamble. I think we can share this and people can take a look. But again, it is inspired by language people wrote at this wonderful workshop and just talks about it, you know, its history. This was this um, amazing, you know, prehistoric lake, uh, Lake Bonneville. Uh, it's existed for 13,000 years. It's this unique environment for brine shrimp and brine fly, as we all know. Uh, they're collapsing, threatening the, the uh, migratory birds as well. Um, discusses the um, the you know original peoples and um, who are um, obviously you know traditional stewards of the lake as well, um, and whose you know belief systems um, generally, with as with many indigenous peoples, if not all, um, understand the duty of reciprocity and and care for nature. Um, it describes you know the the booming region, two point five million people who now live here. We are part of the ecosystem of the lake. Um, we are not separate from it. We are, we are the ecosystem and we live within it. Um, and then it talks about you know the suffering that the lake has had in in recent years with you know diversions, you know record low levels, um, near collapse of of the ecosystem, um, and you know the entire loss of large parts of the lake which are now gone. Um, as well as the you know environmental impacts to humans that uh, will result from this you know toxic dust, um, and then it you know it talks a little bit about um, why the lake is important to our own existence and um, expresses the belief that you know Utah and their governments can best protect themselves, their children's future, and the entire community of life by taking bold, quick action. And that um, recognizing you know, the rights of the lake and its encompassing watershed is a way to achieve that. Uh, to get into kind of the you know the substance, you see now therefore we do hereby recognize this is the substance of the resolu the resolution after the preamble. Um, it recognizes um, the rights of the Great Salt Lake, and th those rights um, that it highlights are the right to continued existence and the right to um, a lake water level sufficient to maintain ecosystem health. And this is important. Uh, we all know that one of the big drivers of the uh, collapse of the Great Salt Lake is that it's not having sufficient inflows. And the lake has a right to adequate water to be healthy. And you can define how much water it needs to be healthy. I'm sure our friends at Save Our Great Salt Lake uh, know that information. Um, and then that can, be the, that can be the lake's right to have that amount of water. Um, it also describes the right of um, people in the state of Utah to a sustainable, healthy, natural environment. Uh, again, we are part of nature. I really believe that establishing nature's rights are establishing our own rights as well because we're inseparable. And, um, you know, also I think it's important to establish that, you know, this type of resolution is not anti-human in any way. It's pro-human health, human well-being. It's pro-humans living in a harmonious relationship with the lake. And so I think it's important to have that um, listed here. Um, and then, you know, what does it do? This is, you know, this would be a resolution. Uh, we talked about different models. You can have a binding law, you can have an ordinance, you can go for a state level law. Um, you know, really the, you know, the best thing you could do, I think, for a lake like this is to get a state created legal guardianship body to enforce the rights of the lake. Um, and um, to really have strong authority and not have to worry about local governments being preempted because it's the state government that would be pushing for this. And actually there's a case in Spain for the Mar Menor, it's a saltwater lagoon, and the national government in Spain um, declared the rights of this lake and created this robust guardianship, sorry, not this lake, this lagoon, created a robust guardianship body to speak for the lagoon. And it's been really great um, and, you know, I think really a good model for the Great Salt Lake, um, but you got to start somewhere. And I think by starting with um, a resolution, which is a little friendlier um, and um, much, much, much less likely to run into any legal problems compared to a binding ordinance, let's say at the local level, I think by starting there, you can build a movement and create gentler action and policy direction it could build up something bigger um, and, and more robust. So this is a resolution, but what does it do? It does say that the rights of the lake shall be a primary consideration in all city actions and decisions that concern or may impact the lake, including but not limited to actions and decisions related to water quality consumption and use. So in other words, it's a commitment by local government to say, you know what, we are going to consider the rights of the Great Salt Lake in you know, basically all of our programs. And um, you know that's what cities would commit to moving forward. 
Um, and so they would, you know, the city would think about ways to incorporate this into their decision making. Um, and they would explore the appointment of an advisory body or advisor charged for the responsibility of speaking for the lake and its watershed at the city level. And they would report on the rights of the lake, do things like define the health of the lake and speak for the lake um, within this community. And again, this would um, is a softer, gentler way than a more you know, aggressive law, um, something that's kind of lower stakes, but still presents a really powerful message and gets communities in the process of beginning to speak for the lake. And I hope can show proof of concept that if a city can support the rights of the Great Salt Lake, if the city can give um, the lake a voice and do so in this, you know, again, soft and gentle way, um, we can show proof of concept and build up to something that's you know larger and more robust um, as we gain support and awareness. So that's kind of the strategy, the background, and um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Grant. This is so exciting. Um, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Go ahead and drop them in the chat. I know Grant was doing a pretty good job answering some of the earlier questions. I'll scroll through. Um, I guess I'll just kick off Next steps here, of course. So someone did mention that they would love to see this. We'll post this um, and I would love to create a form and just kind of invite community input, whether it's further questions or ideas or things you should you think we should add. Um, so I'll make all of that happen after this call. Um, but once we have a draft or a resolution that we're happy with, next steps are basically like shopping it around to city councils or what would you recommend? See, I'm still off mute, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I would talk to um, you know, anyone interested. It could be community groups. It could be, sure, lawmakers. could be a mayor. I mean, there, you can do um, just proclamations or another legal tool that are um, a little, little um, less detailed than this, but can still get the message across. Um, and, you know, show up at a, at a town board or city council hearing consider speaking on behalf of the Great Salt Lake to make a point. I think that would, that's always fun to do. And, um, you know, part of this as well, section E is about encouraging, you know, cities to come together, um, you know, cities that are interested in this or adopt this to come together. So um, to, towards a common vision. So I would also encourage any towns that are interested in this, lawmakers, mayors, citizens groups, um, you know, indigenous peoples, whoever is interested in this, um, you know, start to form a network and, and talk to each other. I love and again, that. Salt Lake, I think, is a great. Yeah, I think you kind of just answered this, but on our road to, you know, the city governments, Joan asks if this resolution could also be adopted by organizations, congregations, and other groups to encourage the city. Um, I think that sounds like a great idea. Kind of build this movement as we bring it to local governments. Yeah, I, I'm in support of that. I think that's a great uh, question for uh, Talking Rivers as well, because they're really building this amazing movement. Um, and I'm sure have had a lot of groups come out in support as well as governments. Maybe I could kick that over to them. So yes, yes, we've had a little bit similar to exactly what was suggested. So we have, in our case, we're, they're, they're called Watershed Guardians. I know if you call it guardianship, I that gets very confusing. Um, but you it could be watershed advocates. It could be any any term that you want to use. That the people sign a resolution, which is very similar to laws that we hope would be passed, um, and which came together through a process of direct citizen action of everyone from youth to elders, from both settler and indigenous communities, coming together and writing a law. So that kind of got distilled into a resolution that organizations and individuals are signing, and with, which gives a lot more weight to when you actually approach it legislators or town council people. Thank you. Um, Doug asks, are there any good examples of rights of nature movements working successfully in conservative areas? If so, any specific strategies they used? I know there's been movement in Colorado. I'm not sure if those towns have been conservative or not, but do you guys have any examples of uh, success in conservative areas? Yeah, well, you know, one example is this recent Orange County, Florida uh, Declaration of the Rights of Rivers there was passed overwhelmingly in a you know conservative uh, part of the state. Um, eventually, it, it you know ran into some obstacles um, due to the nature of the, the drafting and such. But um, yeah, there's been support there. there. You know, there's a lot of the early days of rights of nature back in like the 2000s. 
the aughts um, was smaller towns that were concerned about the well-being of the of the environment when these you know big industrial processes were coming into town and kind of threatening their quiet way of life, um, which in many ways was this you know existence of harmony with nature with you know conservative smaller communities. Um, maybe you just didn't use the same language as the environmentalists, but there's there's the same idea. Um, so yeah, for sure. You know, I think again the biggest um, the biggest skepticism I'm, I might hear from uh, more conservative communities are things about property rights. Um, and you know, again, I would I would make the point you know to explore what property rights mean to someone and is you know is uh, this kind of refreshed relationship um, where you are stewarding the land, you know, really not something that you might want anyway. Um, so yeah, it's about having conversations and uh, listening to what, you know, people's, people's goals and communicating with them why it's, you know, helpful to, to reorient ourselves as being part of nature and good for their, you know, children and children's children as well. Because I think people are, um, from all backgrounds and communities are concerned about you know the future that that we're leaving our children not not to go too heavy into the it's about humans uh camp but i, I think that isn't something everyone that cares about thank you um i know utah's you know got this conservative reputation but i always am wondering if because we have this dominant you know faith-based culture whether that spirituality can't be kind of you know, widened to include this reverence for nature? Like, can we harness, um, can we harness that for the rights of nature movement? Um, Lisa asked if the resolution has been shared with the Utah legislature. This is the first time we've shared this with anyone. So next steps will be um, <clears throat> finalizing it. And then maybe like Joan said, you know, getting a larger movement of groups together and uh, starting at the local level. I think we'll see more success there um, given our state legislature's track record lately. Um, so there was a question. Kathy says, in the case of the Great Salt Lake, how would the transition to a rights of nature model deal with the existing water rights under the Western ownership model? Such a good question. Yeah, I have a few thoughts about this. I mean, um, you know, I think you need to do it gently because, you know, people on the, on the one hand, people are you know, obviously have an interest in their water rights and it's an economic interest. Um, also, um, on the other hand, I think we're seeing with, you know, the Colorado River that um, sometimes bigger change is necessary. And, and we're seeing the federal government kind of step in and, you know, throw its weight around to try to save the Colorado River right now. And that's, that's interesting to think about um, how that same kind of movement might apply to the Great Salt Lake. Um, you know, imagine this future and it's, you know, again, not so different than what we have. The lake has rights. The lake has legal guardians that speak for it and enforce its rights. Um, the lake can uh, purchase in-stream flows. And you know, right now you can purchase temporary uh, in-stream water rights. Uh, that's something that you know trusts can do, for example, and are doing. Um, what if the lake could purchase those water rights? And what if the lake obtained you know adequate water rights to achieve its health? And what if it had a right to that water? So you know, that's that's kind of how it could fit into there. Um, again, I don't think, um, you know, I, I, folks here know the local politics better than I do, but I think if we're talking about like giving the nature a voice and letting it like kind of be a player in this existing system, like is that so different than what we have right now? And, um, and you know, maybe we can just allow it to, you know, obtain the water it needs to be healthy. That's one way to go about it. Uh, there's other ways as well. I think you need to do it gently. You know, you need to work with people on win-win solutions. For example, what if the state of Utah helps people um, use less water and the water that is saved through these new technologies or, or programs is dedicated to in-stream rights for the lake that is held by the lake itself? There's some win-win ways to go about this that I think everyone can get behind and that's what I would focus on first. Thank yes. you. Oh yeah, go ahead. Just to jump in about messaging, we, it's also helpful then to kind of break down then what's just as Grant said, the conception of what is a right. Um, and we see right as also a resp responsibility um, that goes with that right. So really focusing on and the responsibilities that we all have. And it's a big shift. This book could take time, but I think that it's also a very needed shift. And seeing as how everything is so dire with the lake, I think the notion of us giving and receiving that interchange that is in some way the foundation of rights and even water rights, um, I think that that can play in that what is our responsibility in this equation. 
Thank you. Um, we'll take Mary's question as our last. This may be a trick question for y'all since I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, the North Arm and the South Arm of Great Salt Lake are separated by the railroad causeway and the North Arm is the pink. I don't know if you've seen the photos, but not a lot of life, maybe no life up there. Um, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, but there's an issue now of they recently raised the berm um, so that water flowing in stays in the south arm um, rather than going into the saltier north arm and letting that salty water raise the salinity of the south, south arm um, with the idea being that um, the ecosystem is in the south arm entirely and so trying to protect that ecosystem but I'd be, I'd be curious to hear how you guys think about that like this idea of you know rights for the whole lake versus um, sacrificing a part of the lake I know um, among like the scientists and nonprofits we've talked to everyone seems pretty conflicted like it's not something that anybody wants but I think at this point um, from an ecosystem and bird perspective brine shrimp brine flies I don't know that they had other options so I'd be curious if you guys have any thoughts on that. Go ahead if you if you have thoughts. I have, I always have, I have thoughts. We all have thoughts. I can go first or second. You 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 spoke first. You can go first. Can <laughs> That's true. I, I back myself in a corner by talking. Um, you know, this is the classic environmental emergency room situation, you know, triage of the environment that we deal with so much. Um, let's get it, let's get this thing as close as we can to collapse with, without trying to cross the line so we can scrape as much value out of it as we can. And 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 then with the Great Salt Lake, we cross the line, um, unfortunately. So I, you know, I don't want to maybe, I don't, I don't think I'm, I can pick one side or the other. I will say, I think the whole ecosystem has a right to to be healthy, um, but I also um, understand the practicality of not trying to prevent a total collapse through this you know, triage. Um, so, you know, that's complicated. I'd say long term, certainly the entire watershed, not just the lake, but the whole watershed, which is, you know, this much larger area and, and all the, you know, the, the rivers and tributaries that flow into it have this right to be part of this larger interconnected healthy system. And that's the vision of the rights of nature is this larger healthy interconnected system. And that's what we're moving towards. Um, you know, you also have to start somewhere. So that's, a, that's a non-answer from a lawyer. So I'll pass it over to talking writers. Well, I think that we agree with Grant. It's a very conflicting situation. And objectively speaking, I think, yeah, the, the whole of the entire lake and the entire ecosystem, all the rivers, or like the entire basin should have rights. None of it should be, should be ignored. Like the river should be let free to flow, at least to a larger extent than they are. The lake should have the intake of water and, um, the birds, like everybody, should have their the rights to exist as they should. They they have the right to exist, and that involves the north end of the lake. Also, when we take decisions like this um, on the outside, they might look like yes, this is probably the only thing that can be done. But sometimes I imagine the unintended consequences, like uh, as humans. Our science uh, um, convinces us that we are super powerful. Indeed, uh, in our superpower and elevating ourselves to gods, now we have God's problems to solve. Um, so since I don't believe we are gods, and um, one of the ends of the lake has been cut out, what does it actually mean for the lake? We do we know everything that that the fact that that side of the lake is more salty, like what is it providing to the rest of the lake? And there might be an imbalance that is created by doing that that we will never know of. Maybe there are species that are surviving on that connection and that we can't even conceive of because they're too small. So I think like when these dramatic decisions are taken for the what we can see for the larger scope, probably. Yes, but there is also the underneath that we don't know about because we don't know everything. So I think we, sh as a society, we should go towards respecting and towards preserving and helping and healing and uh, stewarding than uh, just these invasive action, even like sometimes to solve things because what are the unintended consequences? Yeah, and maybe too, it's about 
kind of this conversation around how did we get into this emergency situation that forced that impossible decision in the first place and how can we you know repair the things that got us there and start to think differently um so we're a few minutes over time thank you guys so much for joining us thank you grant thank you talking rivers um like i said i'll share out our resolution and we'll have an opportunity for your input um and this is the first of many conversations like this so i hope you will join us in the future and i would love talking rivers we've got a an event coming up in uh october if you guys want to share that with the audience so we are organizing as lake mentioned before an art conversation symposium called listening to water um, and in this conversation, we're kind of asking that question, what would it happen if we actually listen to these ecosystems? What happens if we would listen to the Great Salt Lake? What would the Great Salt Lake tell us? Um, and so part of that is an exhibition, um, which artists had that day difficult task to imagine what that would be. Um, but also just to talk about what Chandler asked, we have different events in which we hope to weave together both all many different geographies. As Blake mentioned, we really want to unite people in this struggle. And so one of them is Watershed Guardians East to West, um, in which we are hopefully bringing people from, say, the Great Salt Lake um, to speak with people from our watersheds, our bioregions. Um, some of the other speakers will be Jack Finder, who is a a lead attorney for the Saxuadal tribe, who pushed forward the rights of salmon case. We should also have folks that um, Grant mentioned from North Carolina, um, who are working on the rights of the Haw River, um, as well as people who are working from our watersheds. And so that will be happening on October 4th. Awesome. Can't wait for that. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, thanks for tuning in and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.